In 1957, as the Cold War raged between the capitalist West and the communist East, the Parliament of the United Kingdom, rather than following a similar track as the United States by expanding the armed forces to combat Soviet aggression, instead acted on the advice set out in a white paper as drafted by newly appointed Defence Minister Duncan Sands. This white paper chose to reorganise and cut back the British military might as an answer to the economic difficulties plaguing the nation following the end of World War II. The results of this white paper, earning a notorious reputation due to its overwhelming effects on the British defence industry and the armed forces. This was most notable for the RAF, where dozens of advanced proposals from the various aircraft builders of the country were swept aside in favour of non-manned and ballistic missile alternatives, essentially stripping these companies of a majority of their work and reshaping the future for Britain's aircraft industry. The situation of Britain in the mid-1950s was one of huge economic stagnation and political decline on the world stage, all of which could be linked to the expense and disruption caused in the fight against Nazi Germany during World War II. The catastrophic loss of Britain's economic autonomy was demonstrated in that, during 1954, the UK was the largest economy and military power in Europe, with a gross domestic product that was 22% higher than France and 9% higher than West Germany, while at the same time being generally on even terms when it came to the productivity of manufactured goods. However, due to the ongoing dependence of Britain on the might of the American economic machine so as to keep the nation supported, successive governments required the continual cutting back of public expenditure year on year so as to make Britain more self-sufficient going into the 1950s and 60s, thereby leading to decreases in the productivity and output of the country when compared to its European counterparts. This was illustrated vividly in the fact that, by 1977, Britain's productivity had only increased 1.68% when compared to 2.66% for France and 2.77% for West Germany, while the national GDP had dropped to being 34% behind France and 61% behind West Germany. This overall retreat was reflected across all sectors of the government's vast array of departments and nationalised industries, including offices for national defence, which comprised five departments of state, the Admiralty, the War Office, the Air Ministry, the Ministry of Aviation, and an earlier form of the Ministry of Defence. At the start of 1957, Britain's prestige as one of the main superpowers of the global scene had taken an irreparable blow in the wake of the Suez Crisis of the previous year, when following the nationalisation of the Anglo-French Suez Canal Company by the government of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, French, British and Israeli forces launched an invasion that made rapid military victories as the coalition easily overwhelmed the armies of Egypt. Unfortunately, political pressure by the administration of American President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who threatened to sell the US government's pound sterling bonds and call in the wartime debt the UK had to the United States, essentially rendering the British state bankrupt overnight, saw the British and French elements of the invasion withdrawn after only two days. The national embarrassment of the Suez Crisis ultimately resulted in the resignation of British Prime Minister Anthony Eden on January 9, 1957 replaced in this role by Harold Macmillan, Macmillan appointing four days later Duncan Sands, the son-in-law of Winston Churchill and an early proponent of European unity, to the rank of Defence Minister. Sands, fully aware of the rapid development in missile and rocket technology, was determined to ensure that an entirely new political, military, technological and scientific mindset was adopted that would dictate the future of Britain's military policy going into the late 1950s, specifically when it came to the development of a nuclear deterrent. In the wider context of the Cold War, Britain had become the world's third nuclear-capable power behind the United States and the Soviet Union, following the testing of its first nuclear weapon, the Blue Danube, during Operation Hurricane on October 3, 1952. Britain's nuclear deterrent would subsequently come to pass as the Bomber Command Main Force, or V-Force, which comprised three main types of bomber, that included the Avro Vulcan, the Handley Page Victor, and the Vickers Valiant, the V-Force reaching its peak during June 1964, when the British nuclear bomber fleet consisted of 50 Valiants, 70 Vulcans, and 39 Victors in frontline service. In parallel to the V-Force, the UK's initial attempt to develop an independent medium-range nuclear ballistic missile system was the Blue Streak project of 1955, though despite the design being generally completed, and ready for production by 1957, the entire scheme was cancelled during 1960 due to concerns that the missile system was too vulnerable to a preemptive strike. 
There were also serious issues regarding its expense, the Blue Streak project having jumped from £50 million in 1955 to £300 million by 1959. Estimates at the end of the project, considering that the overall cost would come to £1.3 billion. With the Blue Streak project having illustrated the significant jumps in expenditure that could occur when developing future weapon systems, the government rapidly employed a policy that would cut the defence budget, with Macmillan, serving as Chancellor of the Exchequer in May 1956, expressing his belief that fixed wing interceptors were not effective against ballistic missiles. It was his consideration that fighter command at the RAF had generally lost its purpose in this new field of warfare, the likes of the Hawker Hunter and the Gloucester Javelin being deemed as the last of their kind in RAF service, although he appreciated the need for shipborne fighter defences for the fleet air arm, as well as for defending British overseas territories. This viewpoint was echoed for manned bombers by the former wartime air officer commanding-in-chief of Bomber Command, Sir Arthur Harris, better known as Bomber Harris, who believed that ballistic missiles would rapidly become the future of long-range combat. Therefore, Macmillan, upon his rise to the premiership, appointed Welshman Aubrey Jones as Minister of Supply, with Jones, upon noting the severe lack of foreign interest in British-built products, especially in military applications, coming to a similar conclusion as Macmillan, in that cutbacks should be made to the defence industry, with a policy of survival of the fittest being implemented on weapons and aircraft manufacturers. By 1957, the British aircraft industry was one heavily disjointed by dozens of builders who had little to no compatibility or desire to cooperate on large-scale projects, with duplication and fragmentation abound. Perhaps the most high-profile example of this lack of communication between the manufacturers was with the ill-fated Supermarine Swift, a single-seat jet interceptor that was envisaged as a second-tier backup in the event the frontline Hawker Hunter failed to achieve the desired results. The Swift, following a protracted development, was launched in 1954 and immediately illustrated that it was uncontrollable at high speeds, while attempts to modify the original F-1 into the F-2 so as to alleviate the problems only served to compound them and create a thoroughly dangerous aircraft that resulted in a slew of fatal accidents. The fallout of the Swift debacle and the huge public scandal both in the UK and abroad severely damaged the prestige of the British government, the RAF, and the aircraft building industry as a whole. The cabinet of then Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, in the wake of the Swift fiasco, agreeing in January 1955 that a white paper should be drafted called The Supply of Military Aircraft, as penned by Professor Keith Haywood, a prominent writer on the state of the British industry. The conclusions of Haywood's white paper were that the aircraft building process should be heavily modified and streamlined so as to allow for the stripping back of multiple models serving the same role within the RAF. At the same time, the most valuable project for fighter command was the Gloucester Javelin, which was designed to intercept Soviet nuclear-armed bombers and was considered a vital counterpart to the V-bomber squadrons that were coming online between 1955 and 1958. The Javelin was developed as an asset that could be shared among its NATO allies and was thus funded until 1956 in part by the United States, with a view that 300 of the 436 Javelins produced would be based in West Germany. During the mid-1950s, 26 active research projects were on the go concurrently, that was costing the taxpayer around £500 billion, or £10.5 billion in 2023, while total spend for aircraft production came to £34 billion, although this had little negative effect on the strategic bomber programme due to this protracted development being done in step with the assembly of nuclear weapons projects. The need for Fighter Command to have a less fragmented development of projects was exemplified in the fact that such inconsistency was delaying vital work on the continued progression of supersonic concepts, and also meant that the RAF, in the event of conventional war breaking out between NATO and the states of the Warsaw Pact, was equipped with models that were inferior to both its allies in America and France, but also its enemies on the other side of the Iron Curtain. In 1956, the Ministry of Supply seriously and openly considered the way in which the growth of larger technical teams could be encouraged, while weaker firms with a record of poor performance should be shortlisted for relegation through the selective allocation of contracts. With this mindset, Macmillan announced that the newly appointed SANS would develop a future defence policy that would secure a substantial reduction in expenditure and manpower, while at the same time preparing the industry for a comprehensive reshaping and reorganisation of the armed forces. 
However, the Air Ministry, at the behest of a sceptical government, had already undertaken a swathe of cancellations prior to the publishing of Sands' white paper in April 1957, the first design considered being the P-1083 of Hawker Aircraft, a supersonic development of the standard Hawker Hunter that was fitted with a new 50-degree swept wing and armed solely with guns. The P-1083 had been given approval for development by the Air Ministry on December 12, 1951, with manufacture following in April 1953, the design being amended during the same year so as to incorporate the de Havilland Blue Jay air-to-air -air missile as its primary weapon. Sadly, this created problems due to a lack of space for radars, fuel and other equipment, and thus led to the project being cancelled two months later, the partially completed prototype being repurposed into the prototype Hunter F Mark VI with the Rolls-Royce Avon 200 series engine. Similar to the P-1083 was the Supermarine Type 545, which was originally proposed as another 50-degree swept-wing development of an existing type, in this case the Supermarine Swift, but featured, as built, a crescent wing, thus earning it the title of the Crescent Wing Swift. Approval for the 545 was granted in 1952, but by 1954 a lack of progress and the loss of its role meant its justification rapidly waned, and the program was cut back to just the part-completed first prototype prior to final termination of the whole scheme in December 1955, this decision being made so as to conserve funds for other projects, as the Type 545 was considered now too obsolete to see through to completion. Another early loss was the Gloucester Thin Wing Javelin, which was first drafted in July 1953 and saw the creation of its own Air Ministry specification, dubbed F-153, so as to distinguish the model from the standard Javelin. The Thin Wing Javelin, incorporating larger engines, raised strength factors, and altered equipment requirements that essentially created a new aircraft in its entirety, while sharing only a similar external appearance. The model was expected to be capable of marginally exceeding the sound barrier in level flight, but had the rug pulled out from under it during a visit to Washington, D.C. by the then Minister of Supply, Reginald Maudling, in December 1955, during which he was made privy to secret papers relating to the upcoming Avro Canada CF-105 Arrow Interceptor Fighter that was, at the time, under evaluation for potential use by the U.S. Air Force. The British ultimately dispatched their own evaluation team during 1956 to Canada so as to assess the Arrow for use by the RAF, during which it was demonstrated that the Arrow was far superior than the thin-winged Javelin in terms of performance and capability, helped along further by the fact that Avro Canada and Gloucester belonged to the wider Hawker Siddeley group, thus meaning access to the Arrow could easily be made. Therefore, the thin-winged Javelin was eventually wrapped up during May 1956, though later investigations as to revivals of the project led to a never-realized machine capable of Mach 1.8, while the Arrow itself would be controversially cancelled in February 1959. Eventually, after conducting a thorough appraisal of the British defence and aircraft manufacturing industries, Sands released his white paper on April 4, 1957, which highlighted five concurrent aircraft projects that should be cancelled at the first opportunity, while a sixth, the English Electric Lightning, would suffer a major setback based on the perceived role of fighters going into the 1960s. The white paper not just extended to fighter programs, but also bomber projects, as well as two jet engine programs and a number of guided missile schemes. The first and perhaps most high-profile cancellation resultant of the white paper was the Avro 730, which was spawned in 1955 under specification R156T and operational requirement OR330, which demanded a supersonic high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft capable of Mach 2.5. Originally, designs had been submitted by Avro, English Electric, Handley Page, Short Brothers and Vickers, with the Avro 730 ultimately being declared the victor, and was ordered in prototype form at the end of the same year. The 730, in its earliest guise, falling short of the requirements, but was considered the best choice thanks to its airframe being built of high tensile steel due to the fact that, as a result of kinetic heat, this was the only way of securing the specified Mach 2.5 speed. The 730 was subsequently modified to include a potential role for the supersonic carriage of nuclear weapons into combat under operational requirement OR336, and the design was revised extensively to accommodate this new work. In February 1957, Service entry for the Avro 730 was scheduled to be 1965, and the manufacture of the first test fuselage was well underway at Avro, this being followed a month later 
when the air staff completed an examination regarding the contribution of which manned fighter aircraft could make to the defence of the United Kingdom, which subsequently formed the basis of the defence white paper. However, the air staff also examined the problem of maintaining the nuclear deterrent, and, in view of the increasing capacity of the Soviet defence system, which included surface-to-air guided weapons, it was now considered most unlikely that the Avro 730 could survive during the period it would be operational, thus leading to OR-336 and by extension the Avro 730 being cancelled in April 1957 following the publishing of the White Paper. Much of the reason as to why the 730 was sidelined immediately came down to the fact that, prior to the first prototype entering development, test beds for the Armstrong Siddeley P-176 engine, which included the Bristol 188 research aircraft, wouldn't have entered flight until 1962 due to the complexity of creating the steel structure, nearly a decade after the 730 project was first proposed. Other problems were caused by the aircraft's reliance on advanced systems and equipment that had ample scope for faults, and the fact that the designers could not guarantee that a damaged 730 would be able to return safely to base due to questions as to whether the long slim fuselage had sufficient stiffness. Next to face its demise was the rocket fighters and the Saunders Row SR-177 projects, with the rocket fighter scheme having been developed under specification F124T back in 1952, of which 11 designs were proposed, the two selected for prototype construction being the Saunders Row SR-53 and the Avro 720. The original proposals were powered solely by rocket motors, but after further assessment, these were rapidly converted to a mixed jet rocket power plant through the addition of a small turbojet for use as a backup in the event of the rocket unit failing. Before long, though, both the 720 and the SR-53 were looking distinctly unviable as full production models for operational service, and would instead be reworked for a limited role in the development of future rocket motors and operations at heights of up to 80,000 feet, developed versions of both aircraft being subsequently produced. The SR-53, later dubbed the SR-177, was the only one accepted for production though, as it was considered to be superior over the updated Avro 720, the 720 being cancelled in April 1955 prior to its first flight. The SR-177 would soldier on as a larger design than the SR-53, and would be powered by a de Havilland Gyron Jr. jet and de Havilland Spectre rocket, making it capable of Mach 2.35, while armament consisted of two de Havilland Red Top air-to-air -air missiles. An instruction to proceed was given in September 1955 with 27 aircraft ordered, five flying shell airframes for basic aerodynamic and engine development, three for weapons systems development, and the remainder for more advanced testing and for trials with both the RAF and the Royal Navy. The size of this substantial order also caught the interest of both the Luftwaffe and the Bundesmarine of West Germany, with a German technical mission visiting the UK so as to make a detailed examination of the SR-177. Though not long after the publishing of the Defence White Paper, the RAF prototypes were cancelled in April 1957 and the entire project cut back to 18 units, all of which would be developed for the Royal Navy. Cancellation of these units followed two months later in June 1957, and the SR-177 prototypes continued as research aircraft, with the first two examples flown in May 1957, though due to the removal of their role for both the RAF and the Royal Navy, the air staff had no possible functions for these aircraft to fill. In the end, a reappraisal conducted in August 1958 intended to keep these planes in service, as these were the fastest and most aerodynamically capable machines in operation in the UK, although ultimately, one prototype was lost in a crash, while the second unit remained at work until 1960. In truth, the SR-177 was a project that would likely have seen little in the way of a service career, as through the use of two power plants, this only served to add to the complexity of the design, requiring two different fuels for both power units, with the Spectre rocket requiring the use of very dirty chemicals, including hydrogen peroxide and kerosene, in order to run it. At the same time, the aircraft was being built to satisfy the same role as the more conventional English Electric Lightning, the smoother development of which would have, at the very least, seen the SR-177 only utilised with a handful of RAF squadrons, rather than seeing a widespread deployment. Furthermore, the use of specialist and highly dangerous chemicals for the Spectre rocket on the limited space of a carrier deck led rapidly to questions being asked as to the safety of having such items aboard these vessels while operating in an active war zone. Incidentally, the English Electric Lightning, 
while surviving the slaughter of the 1957 White Paper, had its development curtailed and delayed quite considerably, the intention being to retain the Lightning to provide a short-term fighter role until long-term guided missiles could be drafted in to replace it. However, after the initial cutbacks of the White Paper, it was decided that the need for manned fighters was still vital for the defense of the realm, and thus the Lightning was developed further into the F Mark III with the Avon 300 series engine, the F Mark III being the first stretched or second generation Lightning and undertook its maiden flight in June 1962. This variant also introduced the more advanced Red Top missiles, and would have been a vitally useful version of the model had it not been delayed by the recommendations of the White Paper, the main weakness of the Lightning being its shortage of fuel range, and that it only carried two missiles, issues that the F Mark III could have addressed upon launch in 1960. BAC, which incorporated the assets of the English Electric Aviation Arm upon its formation in 1960, offered more advanced and heavily armed versions of the Lightning, but only in the view of temporary fixes rather than long-term solutions, unaware that the aircraft would remain in a frontline role until 1988. Next to be dropped was the short Seamew, which was designed to answer a 1950 requirement for a small lightweight anti-submarine aircraft that would complement the larger Ferry Gannett that was currently undergoing development, with specification M123 being created to cover this need. The winning design would be the short SP-6, which was christened the Seamew upon its maiden flight on August 23, 1953, the aircraft being capable of carrying over 1,800 pounds of weaponry, including a torpedo, though despite the Seamew prototype quickly becoming notorious for its vicious handling characteristics, together with other development problems, the Royal Navy and RAF Coastal Command ordered 41 units in 1955, although the RAF's order was cancelled the following year. The White Paper of 1957 subsequently disbanded the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve's air branch altogether, and thus brought about the cancellation of the CMU order with it, though by this point 24 production machines had flown and several had been accepted by the Royal Navy. In reality, the cancellation of the CMU was not seen with much regret, as despite its atrocious handling issues, the emergence of anti-submarine helicopter designs, starting with the prototype range of Saunders Row P-531 helicopter models, that took flight in July 1958, and led ultimately to the development of the production Westland Wasp, rapidly displaced the need for aircraft-based anti-submarine models of the type considered by the CMU due to their versatility and ease of use. With the Wasp being capable of deployment from vessels as small as frigates and destroyers, while the CMU was confined to carrier operations, the general attitude was that, had the CMU been brought to fruition, it would have seen a very short career in naval service, as helicopters moved in to steal its role. The 26 units eventually built were broken up for scrap at various locations, the last surviving Seamu, X-Ray Echo 180, which had been purchased by Short on August 31, 1959 for ground instruction at its apprentice training school, being scrapped in 1967. More advanced than the Seamu, though, was the Fairy Delta III long-range interceptor, the product of 1955 specification F-155T which raised the requirement for a long-range, highly advanced all-weather interception system capable of destroying very high-altitude enemy raiders operating at 60,000 feet and Mach 1.3. Proposals from across the industry included the Armstrong Whitworth AW169, Vickers Supermarine Type 559, and the Hawker P1103, the ultimate winner being that from Ferry Aviation, which, unofficially, was known as the Delta III and was a substantial enlargement and development of the famous record-breaking Delta II research aircraft, the first aircraft to achieve a top speed of over 1,000 miles an hour in level flight. The Delta III's wing, center fuselage and fin, were to be made of high tensile stainless steel, with the two-seater aircraft being proposed to carry two huge radar-guided Vickers Red Dean air-to-air -air missiles weighing 1,300 pounds each, and would feature a drooping nose in a similar vein to the later BAC Aerospatiale Concorde for landing. The maximum operational speed for the aircraft would have been Mach 2.27, as provided by two Rolls-Royce RB122 jets, plus two de Havilland Spectre Jr. rocket motors, giving an all-up weight of over 50,000 pounds. The eventual cancellation of specification F-155T actually preceded the publication of the white paper, with Duncan Sands withdrawing the requirement on March 29, 1957 though the prototype Delta III's had not yet been ordered, thus killing both the project and any potential plans to build a production model based on the outstanding Delta II. 
However, many within the air staff campaigned for the Delta III order to be resumed, as the F-155T represented the cutting edge of technology in the 1950s and was by far one of the most exciting developments of the early post-war era for jet aircraft design, being exceptionally powerful and having a top speed that was limited only by the structural limits afforded by kinetic heat rather than power. Regardless, had the Delta III been brought to fruition, it's more than likely that, due to the expense and complexity of the model, the potential of the aircraft beyond the prototype stage would have been very restricted, while the policy of defence using guided weapons was one that was killing models of similar size and role throughout the militaries of the world, including the similar North American F-108 Rapier and the Avro-Canada CF-105 Arrow. Perhaps the only interceptor model to reach full production for this particular class, regardless of complexity, was the Soviet Union's Chupolev Tu-28 Fiddler of 1961, which would remain in service until 1990 with 128 units built. The final aircraft model to be axed under the 1957 white paper was the Hawker P-1121, a project that had evolved from one of the losers of the F-155T long-range interceptor competition, which was dropped for that project due to it being too small. Though the Hawker team continued to work on the design, and revived the scheme in early 1956 as the P-1116 Mach 2 Interceptor and Long Range Strike Fighter. This was refined in June of the same year into the P-1121 Mach 2 Air Superiority Strike Fighter, Hawker eventually financing the project as a private venture, despite being viewed dimly by the air staff, who were of the opinion that it didn't form the basis of a complete weapon system. The overall consensus was that Hawker had a very vague grasp as to what kind of role the aircraft was intended to fill, the general specifications of the P-1121 being the use of a single de Havilland gyron jet, red top missiles, rocket projectiles, and an Aden cannon, with the top speed expected to be Mach 1.35 at sea level and Mach 2.35 at height. Hope for the P-1121 was given an injection of enthusiasm in January 1957, when the Air Ministry declared its interest in taking on the model. The Defence White Paper of April that year rapidly put an end to this scheme though, and despite Hawker agreeing to continue development of the programme at a much lower expense and scale, by 1958 the project had fully disappeared, the P-1121, while having not been ordered by the RAF, seeing no future from the findings of the White Paper, as the new policy blocked any hopes that this design might have been bought to fill a role in UK service. The dismissal of the P-1121 meant a logical counterpart to the Hawker Hunter was lost, which could have seen international interest as per the Hunter, though elements of the P-1121 were ultimately reworked at a smaller scale into the P-1127 vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which would eventually come to fruition as the Harrier jump jet that would garner worldwide success and see combat in multiple theatres. Alongside the cancelled aircraft projects, the white paper also brought down the curtain on several missile programmes, as much like with aircraft manufacturers, the number of concurrent guided missile projects being developed during the mid to late 1950s was also leading to fragmented results. The most notable British surface-to-air missile system of the decade was the Bristol Bloodhound of 1958, which, at the time of the White Paper, was nearing the end of its development process and would be positioned at air bases in order to defend the V-bomber fleet. Coming up behind to supersede the Mark I Bloodhound system was Blue Envoy, another product of the Bristol Company that illustrated improved performance over the Bloodhound, although with the publishing of the 1957 white paper, Sands opted to promote the Bloodhound as truly the only system necessary to provide guided missile defence against approaching Soviet interceptors and bombers should they be able to penetrate defence grids patrolled by the underperforming first-generation English Electric Lightning. Thus, through his encouragement, Blue Envoy was cancelled in favour of simply creating a slightly modified version of the Bloodhound Mark I, dubbed the Mark II, this choice being a contentious one overall, as the Bloodhound missile system was not exceptionally well performing in any of its guises, Blue Envoy having been developed to iron out the various faults with the Pioneer Bloodhound system, which itself was envisaged as a short-term option prior to Blue Envoy's finalisation. The loss of Blue Envoy was also coupled to the reduction of scope and mission for the Linesman Mediator Radar Network, that was being planned to replace the Rotor system of the early 1950s, the government having opted instead to adopt the BMUS radar system of the United States, which would be sited in England, and thus provide long-range missile launch detection and early warning systems 
in the event of a potential strike by the Soviet Union against targets in Western Europe, the linesman system being relegated to intercepting aircraft carrying carcinotron jammers, which the Soviets might have used to mask BMUs. Elsewhere, two engine development programs were also axed due to the loss of the aircraft projects to which they were originally allocated, the de Havilland Gyron and the Rolls-Royce RB106. The Gyron, which began in 1950 as a single-shaft axial jet engine project and was first run on the bench on January 5, 1953, had achieved a planned £20,000 thrust with reheat, which, at the time, made it the most powerful engine in the world. The uprated Gyron, capable of £25,000 thrust, being tested in the short Sperrin bomber prototype of July 1955, but never saw use in a production aircraft. Its original intention was to find development in the Hawker P1121 interceptor, and despite the axing of support by the Air Ministry in February 1956, prospects for overseas sales gave de Havilland the impetus to continue development at its own expense, though in October 1957, with the dismissal of the P1121 under the white paper, the builder opted to cease development work and the engine was abandoned, despite achieving £29,300 thrust. However, the smaller Gyron Jr., developed and used in the Bristol 188 Experimental Supersonic Research Aircraft, found greater success on the Blackburn Buccaneer Mark I naval strike aircraft, and remained in use with this type until 1970. The Rolls-Royce RB106, meanwhile, also aimed to supply supersonic fighter designs, and began development in 1953. The RB-106 featuring a far more complex layout with two separate axial compressors driven independently by single-stage turbines to provide a higher overall pressure ratio of 8-1 and thus a lower fuel consumption during subsonic phases of flight. The external dimensions of the power unit were designed to be interchangeable with the Rolls-Royce Avon RA-14 engine and achieved a basic static thrust rating of 15,000 pounds thrust and 21,750 pounds thrust with reheat this power plant being complemented by a scaled-down alternative dubbed the RB112. Before any examples were built, though, the 1957 white paper killed off the potential supersonic fighter projects for which the RB106 and RB112 could have been applied. The conclusions of the 1957 white paper were not solely restricted to developments in aircraft, engine and missile technology, but also had strong effects on the British Army and the Royal Navy's capabilities as well. The Army, which had a strong presence in the British sector of occupied West Germany as a physical deterrent to land campaigns orchestrated by the communist forces of the Warsaw Pact should they launch a direct attack on Western Europe, was, for all practical purposes, a tripwire force that would alert of any potential advances by the Soviet forces west of the frontier. With the expectation being that, should full-scale war be declared between the West and the East, this would be conducted using nuclear weapons, Drastic reductions in the standing army stationed in West Germany were made when compared to the American forces, as well as corresponding Soviet forces on the opposite side of the Iron Curtain. As for the Royal Navy, this faced its own slew of cutbacks as ships of the line, many of which were constructed only 15 years prior, either during the latter years or immediately after World War II, were either mothballed, sold to foreign powers, or scrapped outright, despite many of these vessels being the very pinnacle of naval technology for the time. Further to the number of ships being withdrawn from frontline service, the Royal Navy was also hamstrung by a lack of investment in forward development, the direction of the future fleet, as per the White Paper's recommendations, being to place more of an emphasis on ship-borne ballistic missile technology to take the role of a large array of surface vessels. At the same time, the abilities of the Admiralty to modify their carrier fleet for the use of jet aircraft were heavily restricted. The Royal Navy, unlike the equivalent American Navy, which was able to develop gigantic supercarriers capable of carrying dozens of fighters and operating them easily in tactical situations, being forced to retrofit their existing fleet of carriers that were only designed to accommodate piston-powered models that were both smaller in size and comparatively sluggish to operate. The inability of the Royal Navy to suitably handle large carrier-based jets was encompassed in the Supermarine Scimitar, a disjointed fighter aircraft that was changed midway through development to the role of a strike aircraft and forced to operate from highly constricted carrier decks that only served to exacerbate its already troublesome handling issues, resulting in one of the worst and most dangerous fighter aircraft ever built. Similarly, early incarnations of the Blackburn Buccaneer could not be launched from British carriers with a full load of fuel, thus requiring immediate in-flight refueling after takeoff prior to continuing on their missions. At the same time, 
Britain's nuclear deterrence system with the V-bomber force was also heavily undermined, as upon the cancellation of the Blue Streak program in 1960, the government opted instead to sign on to the American GAM-87 Skybolt nuclear air-to-surface missile that was being developed by Douglas Aircraft and Northrop. In response, the corresponding Vulcan, Victor and Valiant bombers were extensively modified so as to accommodate this weapon system, though following various problems during testing, together with the fact that, based on ground clearance issues, the externally mounted missile system could only be fitted to the Vulcan bomber, the Skybolt program was cancelled in December 1962. This caused a major political disagreement between Britain and the United States, known as the Skybolt Crisis, the aftermath of which saw the UK provided American Polaris nuclear ballistic missiles following a tense meeting between President John F. Kennedy and Prime Minister Harold Macmillan in the Bahamas, known as the Nassau Agreement. The collapse of the Skybolt program illustrated Britain's dependence on the United States for supplying nuclear weaponry, and was one of the main reasons as to why the UK was barred from entering the European community when it first applied during 1963, while at the same time rendering the V-Force obsolete alongside the RAF's role as Britain's strategic nuclear deterrent. Subsequent to the publishing and conclusions of the White Paper, Sands felt that the existing interceptor fleet would serve until the upcoming Bristol Bloodhound missile system became operational, meaning that any future bomber attacks by the Soviet forces could easily be thwarted. In reality, the dependence on service-to-air missiles was one that had no real future, as it soon became apparent that with the Soviet Union most likely not resorting to the use of nuclear bombers to conduct strategic attacks on British soil, instead employing ballistic missiles that, at this stage, were impossible to stop once launched, meant the Bloodhound system had no enemy to fight. The RAF, in response to the White Paper, were especially critical of its outcomes, particularly following the introduction of the Chupolev Tu-22 and the Myashashev M-50 supersonic bombers, which came online prior to the full development of Bloodhound, while existing interceptors, such as the Gloucester Javelin, were incapable of successfully facing off against these highly advanced machines in head-to-head -head combat. Sands ultimately relented by allowing the English Electric P-1, which would later become the Lightning, to continue development, along with a new air-to-air -air missile to arm it, the Hawker Siddeley Red Top. In the end, Sands' concession as to allowing the development of the P-1 as the Lightning, together with the Red Top, was considered the point where the conclusions of the White Paper were rendered generally obsolete. Though the axing of some projects, such as the CMU, could be justified due to their loss of role and hopeless flying characteristics, the same couldn't be said for more innovative and vital interceptor and fighter projects that could have helped to secure Britain's ability to maintain air superiority on par with the United States and the Soviet Union. The RAF would eventually find a partial crumb of solace in the Lightning F Mark III of 1962, though its lengthy delay proved to be a costly one while the belief that the model would simply be a stopgap prior to the development of superior guided missile technology, as engendered by the White Paper, meant it would continue in service for the next 26 years without a comprehensive upgrade. Ultimately, the RAF and the Royal Navy, so as to fill the shortfall in prospective interceptor types axed by the White Paper, sought the McDonnell Aircraft Phantom F-4 fighter of the United States as a means of bolstering their fleet and would serve with the British Armed Forces from 1968 to 1992. In the end, the loss of work for British aircraft and engine manufacturers was a devastating one, as with their main employ being the development of military models so as to maintain Britain's stand against the communist factions of the Warsaw Pact, the removal of these contracts by the White Paper left them with little to no income, and in some cases saw their outright collapse. As for the survivors, these were eventually forced into two large aircraft building unions, the British Aircraft Corporation or BAC, as formed by the merger of English Electric, Vickers Armstrong, Bristol and Hunting, and Hawker Siddeley, as formed from the merger of Hawker Siddeley Aviation, Holland, de Havilland and Blackburn. Britain, going into the 1960s, was able to regain some of its prestige with the Hawker Siddeley Harrier jump jet, as this provided a superb multi-role platform that could be operated from almost any potential landing strip imaginable. This, however, was countered by the national embarrassment of the BAC TSR-2, a strike and reconnaissance aircraft developed for the delivery of both conventional and nuclear weapons and could penetrate well-defended frontline areas at low altitudes and very high speeds prior to attacking high-value targets deep within enemy territory. While the TSR-2 illustrated many vast qualities that far exceeded contemporaries such as the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark 
and the Sukhoi Su-24 Fencer, spiralling development costs into departmental squabbling and the rumoured intervention of the American government to have the project cancelled in favour of the F-111, the TSR-2 met its demise in 1965, causing a major public scandal. This would lead to the aircraft intended for replacement by the TSR-2, including the Buccaneer and the proposed adoption of the F-4 Phantom II, being maintained to fill what was meant to be the TSR-2's employ. Eventually, the strike role envisaged for the TSR-2 would be occupied by the dedicated Panavia Tornado of 1979, a joint development between the aircraft industries of Britain, Italy and West Germany, while in 1971, the need for a superior interceptor design, as was to be shelved by the findings of the White Paper, was raised again under Air Staff Target 396, so as to provide a suitable replacement for the Buccaneer, the Harrier and the Sepcat Jaguar. This would lead, four years later, to the air component of this requirement being spun off as AST-403, culminating finally into what would become the British Aerospace EAP, or Experimental Aircraft Programme of 1986, that heralded the first flight of what subsequently led to the Eurofighter Typhoon project of 1994. The AST-403 would be the first pure British fighter requirement to be raised after the 1957 White Paper, and illustrated that the need for manned fighters was still an essential part of the nation's defence systems. In the end, the 1957 Defence White Paper demonstrated a somewhat short-sighted vision that guided missile defence systems would be able to achieve a one-size-fits-all policy when it came to warding off any potential aggression by the Soviets, be it through conventional warfare or from a tactical nuclear strike. However, as was demonstrated through the success of certain fighter models, such as the Javelin and the Lightning, Combined with the inefficiencies of systems such as Bloodhound, guided missiles could not be relied on fully as a means of defending against bombers and nuclear missiles, while at the same time having the effect of stripping the UK of many exceptional projects that were at the very cutting edge of aviation technology.